So you can always pinpoint the person who had to send in their title before they actually made their talk. <laughs> That's what that is. But I'll try and do it justice. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research in genetics and how I think it relates to art and how it could relate to art. And hopefully by the end of it you'll understand a little bit why I think genetics is beautiful and maybe you'll agree. So I'd like to start this talk by showing you this image, perhaps one of the most iconic images in my field. And if you look very carefully, you might be able to see a bit of a helix happening here. This is perhaps the first actual artistic representation of a DNA double helix that ever existed. This was penned by Francis Crick in 1953, right around the time that he and his research colleagues deduced the structure of DNA as being in this double helix uh, form. So the field of genetics really took off at that point when we started to understand the chemical basis of how the DNA works. And especially in the last 15 to 20 years, that research has begun to progress at quite a clip due to all of the new technology that we have to work with. But broadly speaking, genetics is the study of DNA. So the structure of DNA, how the DNA code varies, how it's passed on and inherited, and importantly, how changes in the DNA can affect the cell that can, that in which it is contained and the organism that is made up of the cells and the tissues containing the DNA. So my little corner of genetics research is cancer genetics, and I work in this building, which you may recognize as being over the Victoria General, this is the BC Cancer Research Center. You can see it from Broadway and Canby with its petri dish windows. And in our research, we're interested in looking at how changes in a cell's DNA can push that cell into what we think is a cancerous state. So cancer is a catch-all term for many different diseases. They present in many different ways and have very different courses and characteristics, but the one thing that they have in common is that they're all a genetic disease. So a mutation, or rather a set of mutations, has occurred that has caused the cell to now grow in an unregulated way, and that's destructive to the host. So we're working on a very small subset of that very large question. How do DNA mutations cause cancer? It's a very, very big question, as you can imagine. So to dive a little bit into that, I want to talk to you about what DNA is and how it works. So I could give you the high school biology metaphor of DNA is the blueprint of the cell. And we could go through that whole thing, but we've all heard it. And quite frankly, I don't think it's a very good metaphor given what we now know DNA is and how it works. So instead, I'd like to present to you the metaphor of DNA as being more like music. So in this way of thinking, the DNA code is similar to sheet music. So when you look at music, it is a code and the whole point of this code is to instruct a musician how to put notes together into musical phrases. And the shuffling around of these phrases, putting them in particular orders in a particular way, creates a song. And DNA code works much like this. Effectively, the code tells the cell how to string together these chemicals called amino acids into proteins. And these proteins, used in a particular way, in a particular order, with the right timing, create what we know as the cell. So I think that this is, uh-oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I think that this is actually a much more powerful metaphor um, for one reason in particular. You might have heard of this other thing called epigenetics. It's a very similar word. But the idea here is that it's an extra layer of complexity over top of genetics. So when we talk about the genetics of your cell, we're talking about the sequence of the DNA. But with epigenetics, we're talking about how that code is interpreted. So it's like if you have a piece of sheet music and you give it to your musician friend who's never seen this music before and never heard it performed, that person is going to interpret the code based on their artistic preferences. So they may play it faster than you, they may play it with different sorts of inflections and embellishments, they may choose to leave out phrases of it entirely because they're a rebel like that and it sounds better that way for you. And DNA is used the exact same way by cells. They choose 
effectively what parts of the DNA are going to be valuable to use at different times based on the context that they're in. So your body is a great example of that. You have one genetic code. You got half of it from mom and half of it from dad, and it's in every single cell of your body. It's the same. But the cells are very different. A skin cell and a liver cell are do doing totally different things, and they look totally different. They're running off the same code, but they're interpreting that code differently, and they're using it for different reasons and in different ways. So as I said, I work in cancer genetics, um, but I do not use human cells. I work on human cancer and I don't use human cells. I use these cells instead. Does anybody in the room know what this is? Yeast, yes. This is in fact the same species of yeast that made all of the delicious beers that you guys are drinking. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and this is the organism we use in our lab. Yeah, everyone loves yeast. <laughs> Even if you don't know it, you all love yeast. So our lab smells like a bakery at all times and it's amazing. Sometimes stinky, but usually amazing. And we actually use these guys to learn about how changes to the DNA change a cell. And we do this mainly because these guys are super simple. It's a single-celled organism. You can grow them in no time. I can have a plate full of these things in a day, and there's no real ethical concerns with slaughtering them in the millions when you need to. So they're fantastic for that. And the reason that this works, the reason that we can screw around with yeast DNA to learn about our DNA is because even though the sequence is quite different, the code is the same. Like, it's the same thing as sheet music. If I give you a piece of sheet music that you've never seen before, if you're a musician, you still know how to interpret it. You can still play it, even though it's foreign to you, because the code is the same. All life on Earth uses the same type of DNA code, even though it looks different. So even though yeast have their own little song and they have their own little musical phrases that we don't, they've got their little musical phrases saying, this is how you make alcohol, and this is how you make a cell wall. <laughs> things that would be cool if we knew how to do, but we don't. There are some things that we have in common with them. So the little phrases that they have saying, this is how you repair your DNA, this is how you replicate your DNA. Those things are shockingly similar between us and yeast, even though they're in a totally different kingdom of life. So what we can do is we can say, well, these are also the things that tend to be mutated in cancer. So if we want to know which one of those mutations are causing the cell to freak out, we can give them to yeast because they have those same genes. And then we can say, does it make the yeast freak out? Oh yeah, go, oh, they're sick. And that was probably an important mutation. And then we can go back to something like a human cell culture, which are way harder to grow. I've tried, it's awful. Someone smarter than me can go back to a human cell culture and they can check to see if that holds true with humans. So we've learned a lot from microorganisms and you can learn it very quickly. And it's kind of brought us to a point where we are at a bit of a turning point with genetics. So one of the things that microbes have taught us, which is amazing, I actually, I, I'm not even sure how to start, is we have this technology that we've created by learning from a certain type of bacteria how to edit DNA. So what this bacteria does is when it gets infected with a virus, it goes, oh God, a virus and it grabs some of its DNA and it puts it in its own nucleus and it says there, and now I'll know if I see it again, don't trust that guy. And so it keeps them. And it's kind of like a really primordial immune system. It just like keeps all this stuff. And geneticists saw this and they thought, wow, so they can edit their own DNA and it's really, really precise. Like it's really, like it's well done. We had ways to do it, but it wasn't that good. So we took that genetic system and now we can put it in cells and we can tell them like, we would like you to make this edit at this place go and it works. It works. It's amazing. You can do it with almost like practically any cell and you can do it with human cells even. So. We've come to this point where 15 years ago, we sequenced the human, the human genome for the first time. We read one person's entirety of their sheet music, and we said, holy crap, this is complicated. 
And since then, we have learned a lot. We have now gotten to the point where we're editing it and we are writing it. Like we can write it ourselves. We can do it in a test tube. And that's created what I think is a really interesting point in history where we're still not that smart. Like we're getting better at it. Like I think we're getting better really fast. But we're at the point where like the technology is kind of meant for smarter people. And it's gonna be used. Like people are designing therapies with it right now. You can Google it. It's called CRISPR-Cas. It's amazing. And I think that this is a really fascinating point for us to start having a conversation as a society, as a species, about how we feel about using this type of stuff. And I think it's particularly fascinating to ask it right now because now that we have sequenced the human genome, now that we can look at an entire person's code and sequence and we can say, wow, fascinating, you get 50% from mom, you get 50% from dad, but you can also see in the patterns where things have changed because of things that you went through in your life. So you can see places where things got shifted because, oh, maybe you know your mother didn't have enough to eat when she was pregnant with you, or maybe you got super crazy sick for like eight months when you were six years old, and it was this wicked virus, and it got all through you. Like These things leave imprints on the way that your DNA works and how your body works. And so if we start asking, are some of those things part of who we are? Like, my DNA is part of who I am. My DNA tells me, you are an anxious person, and I am an anxious person. If now we have the option to take a technology and say, what if it's possible someday to just change that? What if it's possible to make you not an anxious person? Yeah, we'll just, you know, it's the hormones in your brain. We'll just dial those down a little bit. Your cells will be less responsive. Ta-da! Like, it's, it's fascinating to me that right at the point when we have the ability to make such amazing statements about who we are and how effectively the environment that we were created in produced us. We are an expression of the environment that produced us. Now suddenly it's just fallen on our laps. Oh, and you can change it too. It's like, I should probably be talking about that. And importantly, I don't think it's only scientists that should be talking about that, but that's kind of the situation that we're in right now, is that this is advanced technology, and it's, it's difficult to have important discussions like this if you don't sort of have the full scope of like, this is exactly how it works, this is all the risks, this is exactly what we're doing, this is exactly what the consequences are. And it's difficult to get those things across without sitting someone down and putting you through a six month genetics course and that's not gonna happen. So I think that art is fantastic because it creates this platform where we can express ideas about identity, about rights, about privacy, about consent, all of these things that are gonna be raised by this technology in a space where people are allowed to contend with them and people who are not trained in my field can sit down and say to me like, wow, I never really thought about it this way but this is profound. I have opinions about this. Yes, we all have opinions about this. We should all be talking about it. We should all be talking about it before we go and start using all this sorts of stuff because there is an incredible amount of promise in it. And there's also an incredible amount of danger. So the problem is twofold. First off, you don't want people who have all of the privilege of education and certain cultural backgrounds to be the ones deciding how we're using this stuff. But on the other hand, you don't want to be in a situation on the, other, on the other side of it, where everyone who isn't in the field just decides that this is bad, we're not doing it, I don't like it, no. And we shut down where we could make a lot of important advancements in things like health. Like, you know, there are children born with rare genetic diseases every single day, and this technology could fix that before they're born. Like, presumably, that's the sort of stuff that we're doing with it right now. So. The reason that I'm in front of you today is because I really like to collaborate with an artist to explore these types of themes, particularly themes around identity. And I am not an artist, as you may or may not have picked up on, but I have a tremendous deal of respect for art, and I have a tremendous deal of respect for people who want to get involved with these sorts of ideas, but don't have a platform to do that besides getting in like Twitter arguments about it. So 
I would love to take your questions on this, and I'm really interested in hearing what you think. Does anyone have any immediate questions for Chris? We're all going to have to digest this. That guy? Nope. Uh, oh, 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 God. <laughs> who's, who's first? You? Sure. Sure. Um, so, uh, my name is Chris. I co founded Canada's first biotech community lab. One of the challenges is that it's stuck in academia right now. And I've noticed in Canada the discussions are left behind because of our policy. So as I'm sure you're aware, uh, China seems to be really competing and racing ahead. And earlier this year, they announced they're doing human embryo testing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw, but yesterday they announced in the news that they've done uh, the first successful injection of CRISPR-Cas9, which is, you know, you can literally pick a gene and copy and paste it. Mm -hmm. And they're trying this in, in China right now. And so it's, I'm just curious what your thoughts are about the policy side of it. Because Canada, the U.S., anywhere else in the world that's choosing to choose policy is going to be left behind where other mm -hmm. countries don't have these policies and rules in place and are just going to put themselves up the bleeding path and then we're going to be left to catch up. Yeah, and I, I think that that's what it comes down to is that it's happening whether we like it or not, quite frankly, and I think the fact that it's really rooted in a lot of these ideas of like, Culturally, what do we see as sacred? Culturally, what do we see as acceptable? Culturally, what do we see as an acceptable risk? And just because this is so firmly rooted in those ideas, there are gonna be places where they're gonna jump on it faster. But I think the first thing that we need to accept is that it's gonna happen one way or another. And I personally, I, I think that if we were to just place a moratorium on this, which I think effectively we have right now, um, it's it's just a matter of time. And for that reason, I think that that's why stuff like this is important, is when we do come to the table and we say, okay, this is happening, we want to use it to help people, we want to make sure that it's done in like a justice-oriented way, how do we do that? And the more voices that we have in that discussion, I think the better we're going to be at it. But. I, I certainly, like, I foresee a place we're going to reach where we're going to say this is the line, we're not comfortable with crossing it, and we're going to have to, at the very least, accept that there are going to be other people that are going to cross that line. And that, unfortunately, is a discussion that's like 30 years down the road, but hopefully by the time we get there, we're past some of this other stuff so we can approach it in a sensible way. And that helps. It's important for people like me to recognize that we're never going to have a consensus. And I guess the there's two sides to it. First, we're never going to have a consensus. There are always going to people be people who say this is too far, even if what may it may be what looks quite clear cut to the rest of us. You know, something like if we were just treating cancer patients with this, and that was it, and that's where we stopped. There would still be people who would say, I'm not comfortable with it. So I guess it's a matter of we need to, as a society, say, you know, okay, what are sort of the classes, the classes of society where, or rather like the, the, the places where this technology is gonna do more good than harm? 
and sort of feel out whether the concerns in those spaces are rooted in something that's going to persist. So if the concerns are largely fear-based, but if the benefits far outweigh the risks, and if it looks pretty clear cut, then I'm sure that there will be cases where we have to say like, I know that some of you are uncomfortable with this, but please just trust us. Like, we're not gonna make you take it. We're not gonna make you do it, but these people really want it. We're just gonna try it because, you know, if it, especially if it's for a health reason, like you can't deny people that. And especially if it's done in what we would feel to be an egalitarian way where it's not, well, these people are gonna pay us two grand to do it, so. You know, like as long as it adheres, I think, to social justice principles, and as long as we at least have sort of an overwhelming public opinion that this is valuable and this is going to be a net good, then I think that that would be sort of how you'd make the call. But I mean, this is this is a difficult thing in all forms of policy. You know, you're not going to please everybody, so it's about where do we draw the line and. That's, again, I think that's part of the reason why I'd like to talk to an artist because I feel like as a scientist I'm trained to be like, it has this much of a percentage chance to work and this is how many people it's going to help and you run the numbers and you say, and therefore it's ethical, when it's, that's not how it works in the real world. So I think working with artists and philosophers and ethicists will hopefully make those distinctions a bit clearer.